Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Gresham Technologies PLC Annual General Meeting. Throughout this meeting, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. And these will be made available to you via your InvestorMe company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that this meeting is being recorded. I'd now like to hand over to Ian Mantrella, CEO from Gresham Technologies. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the annual general meeting of Gresham Technologies. Uh, it's now 11 o'clock, and therefore I'm pleased to open the meeting. And I can confirm that a quorum of members is indeed present. Um, I'd like to begin by extending a welcome and our thanks to uh, those of you shareholders who, as requested, um, are following the live proceedings via the Investor Meets Company platform rather than attending in person, uh, which obviously helps to minimize COVID-19 risks. Now, due to COVID-19, we also have limited the number of directors attending in person to just Tom Mullen and myself. Uh, we're in a work bubble in our office in the City of London. Um, and Peter uh, Simmons, our chairman, and all of the non-executive directors are joining via the IMC platform, as you can see on your screens. Although the AGM is customarily chaired by the chair of the board of directors, the AGM protocol requires that the meeting be chaired by a member who is present in person. Um, therefore, I will officially chair this meeting instead of our chairman, Peter, although I will ask Peter to guide us through the formalities of the meeting. After the AGM itself closes, the board will remain available for a short period to answer any more general business questions that may have been raised either before or during the meeting. So I will now hand over to Peter to guide us through the formalities of the meeting. And in doing so, Peter, may I welcome you to your first AGM since taking on the chair role. Thank you very much, Ian. And good morning, everybody. And thank you for attending today. Um, obviously, as Ian said, it's a slightly uh, uh, altered uh, sort of format today to cope with the COVID uh, restrictions. Um, so, but before I start, um, I'd, if anybody's got any specific questions about resolutions that were in the AGM, it, could they make sure that they've asked those before we press on with the rest of the meeting? Because at the end of the meeting, we'll be handling uh, more general business Q&A. But anything about resolutions, if you'd like to ask any questions now. Um, while I'm waiting just to see if there are any questions, uh, I propose to read out the company's AGM statement that was released uh, via, via the RNS uh, system earlier this morning. So the statement reads as follows. I'm pleased to confirm that the current year has started well. We're seeing positive demand in the market for our technology as financial institutions prioritize investment into automation. And year to date trading has been in line with plans for the year. Five new Clarity customers have been signed so far this year, as well as several incremental licenses with existing customers. The acquired Inferalgo business, now performing under the Clarity Connect brand, is performing well, and the non-Clarity businesses are performing in line with management expectations. We look forward to reporting further progress in the second quarter, <clears throat> and will provide an update at the interim results in July 2021. That, that's the end of the statement. I will now turn to matters of the AGM meeting. Um, just checking, Jonathan, have any questions come in about the resolutions? There have been no questions okay. relating to resolutions. Sorry. I will now turn to the uh, formal part of the meeting. Uh, notice of the meeting has been available for the statutory period, so we propose to take the notice of the annual general meeting as read. For convenience, the resolutions will now be shown on screen in a condensed format. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and uh, as just confirmed a moment ago, there have been no further questions uh, submitted during the course of this meeting in, relating, in relation to those resolutions. So as uh, we uh, have no questions, we can move on to uh, the uh, results of the poll votes, which have been 
uh, received uh, prior to the meeting and also um, the uh, votes that have been uh, requested to be cast by the chairman. So Jonathan, um, could you please display the results of the poll votes on the screen and confirm the outcome? Thank you, Peter. Uh, the results of the poll vote are now visible on the screen to everybody. Uh, these results do include the proxy votes that were lodged in advance and which the chairman of the meeting has voted in accordance with the proxy voting instructions. I can confirm based on this that all of the resolutions have been duly passed in accordance with the requisite majority. Thank you, Jonathan. And obviously, we will be putting out an RNS later today to confirm the, uh, the, all the, of the resolutions have been passed. So that concludes the formal part of today's AGM. And we will now turn to uh, the general questions and answers about the business. Um, before we actually move into the questions, I thought, given that there are a number of new faces on the board uh, this year, including my, my own, um, it would be appropriate to uh, to do some introductions. So if we go round in the order that uh, people appear on the slides there, um, and, I, and I'll start the uh, ball rolling. Uh, my name is Peter Simmons. Um, as Ian said, I was uh, appointed to the board in August last year and took over from Ken Archer as non-executive chairman in October. Uh, my background, uh, I'm 63, I'm a qualified accountant. Um, my most recent executive role before turning uh, plural uh, was as CEO of Dot Digital Group, uh, an AIM listed company with a market cap today of about 550 million. Um, I was involved in bringing that company to market and uh, sort of uh, and uh, um, running the, uh, the board um, as CEO uh, for a period of about eight years. Uh, my other board uh, uh, appointments at the moment are as non-exec chair of D4T4 Solutions and Cloud Call. Uh, so that's me. Ian, I think you're next on the list. Uh, yes, hello, everyone. Um, so Ian Minocha, CEO. Um, I joined in 2015 uh, and um, prior to that have... Um, nearly two and a half decades of experience in the software industry, uh, working all over the world, and um, have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the challenge here at Gresham of building the clarity business um, and uh, now entering my sixth year in the business. Tom, I think you're next on the list there. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Mullen, CFO of Gresham. I have been with the business just over three years now. Prior to being with, with Gresham, I was a CFO of a private equity and short tech business. And um, prior to that, ran uh, finance and operations for the EMEA division or EMEA region of Guidewire Software um, after spending seven years with, with Ernst & Young. And uh, Jenny. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jenny Knopf. I joined the Gresham board uh, as non-executive director and chairman of the remuneration committee in the autumn of 2021, oh, tw sorry, 2020, and so I'm very new. Um, my executive career, my last role was chief executive for the post-trade businesses at ICAT Next, market infrastructure, and prior to that I spent uh, over 30 years inside global investment banks, um, living the mess that Gresham is trying to solve for. So very excited to be part of Gresham, and uh, thank you very much for uh, having me on the board. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Andy. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andy Balchin. I've been on the board now for three years, serving as the chair of the audit committee in that time frame. Prior to that and taking on NED roles, I was a CFO of multiple high-growth software companies, in the cybersecurity space, financial services space, enterprise application integration, and enterprise document management. I'm a qualified chartered accountant uh, with significant M&A experience, both in buying and selling companies. I guess I would call myself a generalist and international business builder. Um, and as well as my non-exec work, I also work with a number of other high growth software companies at the moment advising and mentoring their CFOs. Thanks very much, Andy. And Ruth? 
Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Ruth Vanthofer. I joined the board of Gresham Technologies also in October last year as a non-executive director. Prior to that, I spent around almost 20 years in financial services, both in the regulatory side, working in Brussels with the European Commission and the industry, as well as at Citigroup with 11 and a half years. Since 2018, I went plural, uh, similar to Peter. I'm also on the board of Permanent TSB, which is an Irish bank. I'm on the board of Digital Identity Net, a UK fintech working in that space. And I advise a number of fintechs, a Brussels trade body, uh, and I'm also the chair of the Payment Systems Regulator Panel, and um, I'm also a venture capitalist. And I'm very excited about technology and helping the banks and the financial services industry at large to streamline their data and to analyze it better in order to get the benefits that we can start seeing with all the technology coming on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. I'm conscious there's one other face who's on the uh, um list of uh, people down the bottom who's not listed up there, Jonathan, our company secretary. Jonathan, do you just want to say, give a quick brief introduction as well? Thank you, Peter. Yes, uh, Jonathan Cathy. Um, this is, I think, my eighth AGM of Gresham and uh, and, and been involved with all, all of the developments of Gresham since then. And I've got a background in, in law um, and uh, in corporate law in particular. And I've been working with with Ian and Tom, obviously, since since they joined. So it's, it's great to be here once again and to welcome the new board. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, so I think we've got some questions popping up now. So uh, I think probably a, an appropriate point to move into the Q and A. Um, so the first one uh, that uh, seems to be popping up at the top of the list. Um, we've seen some wins in Q one, and the chairman's statement is positive. Can you say a bit more about the levels of activity relative to last year, and also to give us a sense of whether COVID is having an impact? And I'm going to con con con. Uh, join two questions together here as well, which is the, um, as well as the general question about um, whether COVID's been having an impact. Um, there's a second question coming in around the number of clarity clients. Five new clarity clients were signed up. Um, how long did it take to turn these into paying customers and what does the pipeline look like? So, Ian, can I pass that one over to you? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, so I guess just picking up on the, the first point really around general levels of activity in the market, uh, I guess to make a comparative on where we were in the first half of last year and the second half of last year, um, you know, definitely we are finding a lot more uh, engagement from clients in a pre-sales capacity. So if you think about the kind of profile of activity last year, um, we had a period from, I, I would say, uh, mid-March through until early the summer, um, where actually most of our clients uh, went internal. They were looking after their own operations uh, and protecting the resilience of their business and working with their own clients and had very little capacity um, within their organization to engage on new projects. Um, but we did close some business in the first half of last year, and that's largely projects that were in our pipeline uh, as we entered the lockdown. Um, things definitely picked up in the second half um, and we had a good close to the year. And, and what we've seen really since the late part of 2020 and has continued through until, uh, until now is a steady increase month on month of activity with prospects and indeed within our install base. Um, you know, we're finding that our clients have got their budgets in place for 21, whereas in the, in the at the tail end of last year, they were really holding back spend. Um, and we found new projects starting to kick off, uh, as well as um, clearly a number of projects that were in our pipeline last year that got deferred, starting to come through to close. Um, so generally, I would say for, for the first half of this year so far, um, you know, it's been the most busy period for us in 18 months and um you know we're we're seeing good activity in our install base we're seeing good activity from customers engaging us um for the first time and i think much of that really you know comes back to the essence of what we do um, you know we're working to help uh, participants in financial markets automate their business remove manual processes uh, and get 
you know, greater control over the quality of their data. And these are all fundamentals um, in the world that we now live in uh, and the drive towards sort of end-to-end -end digital. Um, so I think that gives you a sense of, um, you know, level of activity. Uh, and I think the second part, Peter, of your question, which was around, you know, the five clients and how long it took to, to bring them to a close, I, I would say actually that, that those sales cycles were fairly typical in the sense that they're all slightly different. Um, you know, we've got sales cycles on large deals that can be often 12 months or more. Uh, and we've got sales cycles on new customers that can be as fast as uh, up to nine months. Um, and, and that's very much the case with the five new names that we've had uh, closing in the first half so far. Um, with our upgrades and uh, extensions of use, in other words, um, new work with existing clients, they can be very quick. They can be something that's been brewing for you know, a year or more. And I wouldn't want to uh, put any timescales around it. But what I would say is, I, I think for us in the, the first five months or four months of this year, it almost feels like we are back to business as usual. And I think if that pace sustains, you know, then we're in a good place for the year ahead. Great. Thank you, Ian. Uh, next question, I think, probably is going to be aimed at you, Tom. Um, it says, uh, there's been an increased focus on reporting forward. Uh, sorry, report, uh, increased focus on reporting forward-looking ARR alongside, alongside booked revenues. Why, why is ARR so important? Yeah, th thanks, Peter. And I guess f first thing to say, though, is we, we, we've obviously always reported or for a number of years have reported our forward-looking ARR but um, the, the, the person who posed that question is exactly right we have increased the focus on uh, forward-looking ARR and in particular that uh, uh, of our clarity business our, our high growth um, exciting business for the, for the future um, number of reasons for that over the, we've we completed our transition to becoming a, a full uh, full subscription business. So we stopped selling Clarity Perpetual or, or term licenses back during 2018. And what that's enabled us to do is, is really take some of the unpredictability that we had historically out of the, the certainly the Clarity business. And it's really enabled us to, 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 predictably, to, to predictably make investment decisions, uh, to predictably um, go, into, go, go into fiscal years with, with confidence as to what, what our out, outturn of the year is going to be. We also, as we make our, our investment decisions during the year, we, we're able to pull a number of levers to, to ensure that we, we take a very balanced approach to ensuring that we maximize our, our revenue growth whilst also maintaining our profitability and uh, in particular actually our cash profitability uh, that we focus on to, to a significant degree. Um, you, you'll obviously all be very aware that you know, for a subscription basis, the forward-looking ARR it is just the traditional, or becoming the traditional way of measuring those businesses. So all those factors added together why, well, come to why we're, we're giving it such increased prominence. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, uh, I think Peter, perhaps I can just add a comment to that. I mean, ultimately, to build up that forward-looking ARR book is is going to lead to improved quality of earnings. I mean, I, I guess that's the crunch as to as to why we're putting focus on that as a KPI, um, and seeing year-on-year -year growth in ARR as we have been delivering, you know, will give you know you, our shareholders, our investors, greater confidence in the quality of earnings moving forward. Well, actually, probably um, that probably leads quite neatly into the next question, actually, which is uh, how are you thinking about balancing investing for revenue growth versus short term profitability? Um, and before I hand that over to, to, to Ian and Tom, perhaps I, I'd just say a few words about that as well. I mean, both in my time as CEO of Dot Digital and in more recent years uh, in my non exec chairman roles, I can say that that is probably the thing that um, exercises the sort of uh, the combined uh, sort of brains of, of most of the boards most of the time because by definition a subscription revenue business um, you are always in the sort of 
judgment, making judgments about the extent to which um, you take your foot off the gas and, and increase profitability by no longer investing in product development, sales, business development, um, or whether you actually put your foot harder on the gas to grow quicker, but because of the, re the, the, the revenue recognition nature of a subscription business, um, the revenue comes in some time after you've spent the money on uh, winning the business in the first place. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge for all businesses. I think public companies are under a different level of scrutiny than perhaps private equity um, would be um, in terms of uh, the focus on short-term profitability versus growing market share. Um, and uh, it was certainly one of the things that uh, always led to some interesting conversations with shareholders uh, when I was um, CEO at Dot Digital, um, and it's one that will no doubt continue to exercise CEOs and shareholders in, in good debate going forward. So, Ian, um, maybe you'd like to say a few words about how you view that challenge. Well, I, th I think it's a really good summary, Peter. And uh, I mean, you're right. Uh, you know, we, we, we live year on year on year, and we have to make the decisions in year, but we also have to make decisions for the long term. Uh, and I think if you think about um, you know, the clarity business specifically, then in the early days, we were investing very, very heavily in product um, and had you know, relatively low revenues coming through because we were clearly building the book of customers. Um, we've now got um, 120 plus customers um, on the clarity side of the house. You know, the product investment period is you know, starting to ramp down. Uh, and we're investing much more heavily now on the sales and marketing side. Um, and as the business matures um, and we build out our global field structures, we build out our global customer support structures, um, you know, then that level of investment also will start to ramp down relative to the numbers of customers and the revenues. And we'll start to open the jaws of the business and get real you know, operational leverage. Um, so... You know, how do we think about it today? We, we, we're still very much in the uh, investing for growth phase. Um, and as you will have seen um, in uh, slides that we've, uh, we've used in our annual and half year reporting, um, you know, we're on a good track here in terms of, um, you know, getting the clarity business to be, you know, uh, cash profitable. Um, and, um, you know, if we project those, you know, those trends forward, then, you know, we'll get the clash, the clarity business to be extremely cash profitable as it scales. Um, so that that's how we think about it, and I, and I think the important thing to say really is, um, you know, there is very good and very healthy challenge around the board, around the annual operating plan decisions that we make, and indeed the quarterly decisions that we make to ensure that we've got the right balance. You know, because ultimately we want to build, um, you know, a, a company of substantial scale. Um, you know, substantially cash generative uh, and profitable, um, delivering the kinds of margins that one would expect of a large, mature software business. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. Andy, can I surprise you? And, and you obviously work quite a bit with um, private equity. What would you say are the, the sort of differences in philosophy between public companies and private equity when it comes to that growth versus profitability sort of uh, conundrum? I think uh, you've 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 partly addressed it, Peter, in um, the ability to make decisions perhaps without relevant without relevance to the public markets. You've mentioned that one already. Um, I think in in many other respects, you know, private equity is always on a short term time frame, looking towards the ultimate sale of the company as well. Um, versus the public markets within which we operate, I think there is the the um, the other the other point I would say is that in many respects the businesses are the, are the same. You know the, what we're trying to do here is is grow the top line, grow the profit line, and grow the cash line. Um, and and all businesses really try to do 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 that or should be doing that. If they're not, then you wonder why they're in business. But you know very much so here. We, we are running this company as a very effective, very efficient company with our eye on the public markets, but being very, very aggressive in the way in which we do invest in stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's great to see that we have got a very strong and experienced management, management team and an employee base as well. Um, and I think that is relevant regardless of your 
your ownership structure, um, and, and this company particularly has that. Um, we've got a highly invested product, um, and again, it doesn't matter you know what what market you're in or what what your ownership structure is. It needs to be highly invested, and particularly in this space in financial services, um, and you know we're in an excellent space there. We've got an excellent customer base, and we invest in those customers. And again, it's it's the same, you know, regardless of what what your ownership structure is. So, um, you know, we we're we're not shy in investing, and and um, and you know, this is a very internationally broad business. And uh, I think uh, you know the, the it's uh, it's something to be proud of. Good. You used the word international there, Andy, and I think you know we're a global business in a global marketplace. One of the things that certainly I've seen in, in, in other businesses that I've been involved in is that perhaps the Americans in particular um, take a, a more aggressive view towards gaining market share in the early days. Um, perhaps Jenny or, or, or Ruth, you may have some observations on that from things that you've seen in your previous um, roles. Jenny, can I, any thoughts from you on that? Do you, do you see a difference between um, American businesses versus UK businesses? Yeah, and well, I think I think you said it very clearly there, Peter. American businesses are really they're they're, they're multiplied very much in the early stage, dependent on evidencing growth of, of market share and client acquisition. So that quickly and, and very quickly will morph into. The confidence around recurring revenue and customer satisfaction uh, and being able to be robust references so that you can continue to grow in a sustainable way so so they start off extremely aggressive in 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 uh, north america around client acquisition but it's but it's got to stay with that product development so that they're meeting the client needs otherwise it falls away so uh, that that tends to be the conundrum to make sure they're not just pleading and promising but they are delivering on that product roadmap, which is where many uh, US uh, fintechs in particular seem to, to fail quite quickly. Yeah. Ruth, any thoughts from you on, on that whole sort of difference between British and uh, other, other nations? Yeah, I mean, you could almost compare it to thoughtfulness versus over-promising. I think it is a very fine line to push hard initially, but then also to deliver, as, as Jenny just mentioned. And, and I think it's it's all about keeping the focus on the customer needs and also understanding the, the customer better than the customer sometimes do themselves. And I think this is a position where you can create sustainable growth. And I think that's certainly what Gresham Technology stands for. Lovely. And actually, that leads quite neatly into the next question, which was, um, uh, I'm going to read this out off the screen. Great to see the new board. What excites them most about the opportunity ahead? So perhaps, uh, Ruth, I could start with you on that one and then lead to Jenny, and then I'll give my thoughts at the end. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I mean, data is something that people have been talking about for the last decade, but getting your data in order, leveraging your data, understanding your data better, uh, getting your data integrity, your quality, and the automation around that is, in my view, one of the most important things that every business across the financial services spectrum has to focus on with utmost priority. And I think now people are realizing, yes, they're sitting on old legacy infrastructures here and there, but they have a lot of data. They don't know how to deal with this. And this is where we really come into the play. It is an incredibly strategic product and solution set because the data understanding and quality and triangulation really enables you not only to satisfy regulatory requirements, which, which continue to evolve um, and build, but also to really be economically a lot more savvy around your own business and strategy. And I think that's what excites me. It's, it's the data architecture, the data integrity, and the capability of adding value with better data. Okay. And, and Ruth, when you were approached originally about joining the board of Gresham, what, what made you sort of pick, pick up your ears and take notice? What, what, were the, what were the things that made you think this is a great opportunity? I think it's the fact that the business is a stable business that has been existing for some time and that is almost in the process of, of further supercharging. It's the timing in the market where 
the businesses are now starting to buy something that they maybe should have bought five or ten years ago but people are getting ready technology is evolving so it is a sort of time and place moment i i do love the team i love the energy and i do love what is being delivered because this is the enabling to translate the complexity into outcomes I mean, we often refer to sort of, you know, translating all of your data into something that everybody can understand, similar to a Rosetta Stone. And I think that is something that people have been looking for in the market. And when I stumbled across Gresham, which I remembered from many years ago, um, I realized that actually you've got the solution. So that's what excited me most. Great. Thank you, Ruth. And Jenny, what about you? What, what, what was it that made you think it was a, a great opportunity to join the board? Yeah, so, well, I think Ruth has, has said many of the things, but I think, you know, to give some context, so I spent 30 plus years inside investment banks. Um, my last role in an investment bank was the CEO. And everything we wanted to do, every time we wanted to grow, bring agility to ourselves and our clients, add new products and markets, it was data within the bank and data that we needed to do with uh, share and report. Uh, with our with our clients, with our counterparts, and with our regulators, that was the continuous problem. And when I joined ICAT Next for market infrastructure, it was to solve that data problem. And Gresham, I believe, has a has a service and a tool and a product suite and a platform that actually gives that agility. It makes it viable to transform those financial institutions, because the transformation can't be a boil the ocean solution. It's got to be able to something that the banks and, and other financial services firms can adopt on a piecemeal basis, get confident, empower the end users within that organization to actually have some confidence and trust in their own data, and therefore with the data that they've got to report and share with all the participants in their ecosystem. Gresham, has that tool. And both Ruth and I have used this term, which was my nirvana in my previous executive career, and certainly I think is the, the nirvana that Gresham offers. It has the Rosetta Stone. It can translate, simplify, standardize, boring and huge volumes of financial data to bring confidence, trust, and transparency. And that is a unique solution in an adoptable way. And I, I'm excited to, to work with Gresham and be part of the future and the future that I think we all believe exists for them. Thank you, Jenny. Andy, you're, you're not quite a new face, but um, obviously uh, you've been working with the team for a while. What, what, what excites you about the future opportunities? Uh, thank you for commenting on my face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think I've said it, but you know, the, 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 the fact that this is such a strong management team and an employee team is 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 very exciting to me. There's a lot of skilled people here, but the you know the international spread of this business is is not it's not niche in that respect. And I lo I love that. You know, it's a company of this size that is growing to be able to boast that it's got locations pretty much all you know all around the globe, and um, and customers all around the globe. It's you know that's a major asset in itself. So you know, it's I I like the excitement of it. I like the challenge of it. Um, I I like the fact that we are that we do have a, Ian mentioned it. I think robust um, but but very very respectful conversations about where this business is going, and we're all aligned behind that, and and, and that's that's very good. Excellent. Um, okay, I guess my my answer to the question. Um, I was approached. I think it was June last year. Um, by the headhunter who was looking to find Ken Archer's replacement. Uh, and immediately my, my ears pricked up because I'd become a shareholder in Gresham back in 2018. Um, I'd been following a, a, a number of tech businesses, one of which was Gresham. I'd bought some shares. I'd kept uh, sort of track of the business performance over that time. Um, and I think once uh, I sort of had the meeting with the headhunter, it sounded like a, a, a fantastic business to be part of. Uh, but I think what re really reinforced it for me was the quality of the team, uh, Ian, Tom, Jonathan, but also the, the, the whole of the sort of leadership team of Gresham. Uh, I would sum up as professionalism, a passion and a real strong shared vision of where the business could go. And, and that was what excited me. At the end of the day, 
um, to be part of a successful growth story. Um, it's as simple as that. So, uh, yeah, um, really, really grateful to have been given the opportunity and hopefully we will deliver over the next five, six, seven years. I think nine years is the maximum, obviously, that you can be uh, non-exec these days. So uh, got another eight and a half to go. Okay, I think we've possibly run out of questions. Uh, Jonathan, have you got any more popping up on your screen? I can't see any on mine. No, there are no further questions on screen, Peter. Okay, so, I, I mean, probably a, a, an appropriate time to draw to a close. Ian, do you want to just say a few closing words before we uh, shut the meeting down? Um, th thanks, Peter. And, you know, it, it's, it's fabulous, um, you know, to hear from uh, the new board on, on this, uh, this call, actually. And I think... You know what? What's um, you know for me is inspiring is the vision that the management team have and the passion and energy is um, is reflected in the board and we hear it from our customers as well. So I think there's a very exciting opportunity ahead. Um, you know, and uh, to all of our shareholders and investors that have supported us on the journey, you know, going back eight nine years when we first started to invest in Clarity, you know, the business is in a notably different position. Fabulous opportunity in the market. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our shareholders for their ongoing support. Thanks, Ian. And, and I'd like to join in, in also thanking our, our shareholders for their support, but actually on behalf of the board to, to thank you, Ian, and your leadership team for, for, for taking the business through uh, what was obviously a, a very difficult and, uh, and challenging year and a year that certainly none of us expected um, and, and delivering great results and, and coming through with a really strong vision of, for the future and a, a great start to 2021. So thank you very much on behalf of hopefully all of the board and um, and the shareholders. So, Mark, uh, can I hand back to you to sort of uh, close proceedings down formally? Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed to Peter and indeed the entire board from uh, Gresham Technologies PLC. Um, I know investor feedback is important and I will now um, direct investors. So could I please ask you not to close this session as you will be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. And if you could uh, apply um, a little bit of time, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. So finally, on behalf of the management team, I'd like to thank you all very much indeed for attending today's annual general meeting. That concludes today's session. Thank Thank you to you all and good morning. Thanks, Mark.